uh, Dr. Linda Fellini, a McGill University uh, PhD graduate, uh, has a rich history in uh, researching. Uh, we're just talking about uh, vulnerable groups, uh, which she did a lot of her work uh, related to Alzheimer's. And uh, with more than 16 years uh, of in, in, in research ethics, she has been associated with the CIOS uh, West uh, Central Montreal and the MUHC. So as a current uh, research ethics advisor at CIOS uh, West Central Montreal, uh, Dr. Fellini offers uh, educational support to its research community, including ethics board members, uh, researchers, and their teams. So her deep understanding of the regulatory framework uh, governing research, coupled with her role in shaping institutional uh, policies, underscores her expertise. So her dual uh, perspective as a past and present researcher gives uh, a unique insight into the potential challenges encountered by research uh, professionals and their collaborators. So one of the things we're trying to do is um, uh, so that you can be at least aware of uh, the ethics and uh, when you come to, let's say, applying for grants and on things like that, or just doing uh, uh, bench work, you are aware of uh, the importance of, uh, of ethics. So um, Dr. Fellini, thank you very much uh, for paying us a visit. Uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Mawali, and thank you for inviting me to, to give this presentation and to um, talk about research ethics. Uh, we don't often have that opportunity, and I think it would be very it's very helpful for especially for those new in the new to the research enterprise. So I cannot I cannot cover all topics today. Just a moment, I'm trying to. Okay, I can talk uh, cover all topics today, but the objectives that I'm trying to achieve for this webinar is to give you a background on the REB's authority and its structure, help you appreciate the roles of each REB member and their corresponding responsibilities, to be better prepared in identifying ethical issues and ethical requirements when submitting your studies to the REB. Oops. Oh, that was I. That was I'm sorry. That was the objectives. <laughs> so I'll go back now. So the outline. So the topics I'm going to address are so the. Just a minute. Uh, can everyone see? Uh, because I, in the chat, somebody says that they. Yes, we can see it. You can see. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yes. So okay. I'm sorry. I I skipped over the objectives, but I think you've understood them. Um, in, so the topics I'm going to address today are the REB and its authority, REB members' roles and responsibilities. I'll touch upon certain aspects of informed consent. I'll speak about the threats to voluntariness of consent. Um, I'll also speak about the retro, retrospective health records research without obtaining informed consent from participants and a very short summary at the end. A number of, of major scandals occurred in the 20th century that led to the creation of ethical frameworks on which to evaluate research studies and the establishment of governance structures for REBs in place today. I list a number of scandal, uh, scandals on this slide, but I will discuss just four of them due to time limitations. So it's not an exaggeration to claim that research ethics grew from abuses and scandals. And you may be already familiar with some of them listed here. During the Nazi regime, many atro atrocities occurred and they included conducting horrific experiments on prisoners kept in concentration camps. These prisoners were tortured and dehumanized by their captors. They were used as expendable means to an end, any cost to advance knowledge. When the Second World War ended, Nuremberg trials were conducted and they ultimately led to the establishment of the Nuremberg Code. The, this code established the ethical principle of voluntary informed consent. In Tuskegee, Alabama, 
African American men who were poor share poor sharecroppers were recruited to take part in a study sponsored by the U.S. federal government. It began in 1932. The study involved studying symptoms of syphilis and its progression. In 1932, when the study began, no cure for syphilis existed. Those that were enrolled in the study uh, did not know that they were taking part in an experiment and were offered unethical incentives. In 1947, penicillin became standard care, standard care, but instead of offering this treatment to the study participants, it was withheld. It took until 1972 for the scandal to break and for participants to receive treatment. Another US case involved a renowned anesthesiologist and researcher named Beecher. He may be known to some of you because he was noted for his definition of death. Today, he would be what we would commonly call a whistleblower. He published a seminal study in the New England Journal of Medicine, demonstrating that people were enrolled in the research without their knowledge. This occurred in, 19, in the mid 60s. He played a major role in the lead up to the NIH requiring studies to undergo REB review. In the US, in addition to these two scandals, a number of other ones were, in, were, were uh, occurred and they received extensive media coverage. And this is in the 60s and 70s. In response, the US federal government created a national commission for the protection of humans in research, which was charged with creating an ethical framework for research, eventually leading to the US government adopting federal regulations that govern research ethics boards known as IRBs in the US. In Quebec, a Montreal doctor in the 1990s had submitted falsified data for a B06 lumpectomy study funded by the FDA. After the FDA conducted its audit, the Quebec government set up a commission to investigate this scandal, which later led to laws and policies to protect participants in research, including a framework for creating a structure for REBs. And this occurred in 1998. I've provided these examples to highlight that the development of laws, regulations, policies, and procedures that govern research, including the establishment of research ethic board came about not because it was the right thing to do, but overwhelmingly as a result of scandals and abuses. The establishment of REBs in Quebec resulted from the laws, rules, regulations, and policies put in place by the government. In 1967, the first REB was created. In 1990, 56 REBs were in place. In 1998, as I referred to previously, the Ministry of Health and Social Services, the MSSS, adopt, adopts a regulatory framework to structure REBs. In, 19, in 2020, the MSSS adopted a new regulatory framework that updates the requirements for the structure of REBs. And this, this regulatory framework applies to all human research conducted in the Quebec Healthcare Network. So what is the role of the REB? Simply put, it's to protect the rights of human participants and to promote their well-being in research studies. As I mentioned, the Quebec, uh, Quebec adopted a, a regulatory framework entitled the Corps de référence ministériel pour la, pour la recherche avec les participants humains. In, and it makes specific how the REBs are structured within institutions and notably within these institutions, the REB is independent in its, in its decision-making. It exists as an independent body within the institution reporting to its board of directors. The board of directors appoints research ethics committee members upon the recommendation of the REB the board of directors is obliged to provide funding and support for the functioning of an REB, of the REB. The institution has a responsibility for ensuring the REB is protected from undue influence. 
For any research study conducting, conducted within its jurisdiction, the REB can approve it when the REB is satisfied that all conditions that it requires are met. They can require a modification to it when it and when the modifications are sent to investigators, and these are usually called conditional approvals. The REB can refuse a study outright, which is rare. It can defer a decision about a study. This usually happens when the REB is lacking information to make its decision. And the REB can suspend it. For example, if an allegation of misconduct has come to its attention or an application for an annual renewal has not been submitted within the time frame required. And finally, the REB can terminate a study. Such an occasion may such a situation may occur when participants are placed at risk for harm. The REB can request, receive, and share information that it thinks necessary. If it shares it, the REB must be ensure that the confidentiality of that information it, it must ensure the confidentiality of that information. The REB takes any reasonable steps to ensure that the rights of participants are protected and their well-being is promoted. For instance, if it becomes aware of an allegation of misconduct, it, it can request that the study become an object of a review. It can also request that a study team receive education on research ethics. The REB ensures ongoing oversight of research studies. It conducts passive mandatory reviews, such as reviewing annual review of ongoing studies and amendments, serious adverse event reporting, and so on. It can also conduct active reviews. The REB can actively conduct random or targeted reviews of ongoing approved studies in a systematic fashion. We do not yet have a quality assurance program in place that would allow for such reviews, but one is envisioned. The CS West Central Montreal REB has a special designated status conferred to it by the MSSS. This designation permits our REB to review studies involving minors and adults incapable of giving consent. Article 21 of our civil code stipulates the following. The research project must be approved by a competent research ethics committee. Such a committee is formed by the Minister of Health and Social Services or designated by that minister from among, uh, from among existing research ethics committees. The composition and operating conditions of such a committee are determined by the minister and published by the Gazette Officielle du Québec. As I mentioned, we hold this designation and the studies that are the studies involving minors or adults are reviewed at a full board REB meeting. However, it's my understanding that the government is reviewing this law as it applies to studies involving minimal risk. According to the MSSS's regulatory framework for researchers, when investigators submit a study to the REB, it must undergo a triple review. This three-part review includes, of course, a research ethics review conducted by the REB, but it also includes a scholarly review, sometimes known as a science review, and a feasibility review. A scholarly review is conducted to ensure the study meets re re relevant disciplinary standards. It's unethical to enlist participants in a study if the study is not considered to have scientific merit. If a study was approved by approved for scholarly merit by an outside committee recognized by the REB, such as those from granting agencies, FRQ, SHRC, and CIHR, the study does not require a scholarly review, but there are exceptions. However, and importantly, the REB's mandate does require examining the ethical implications of the research methodology proposed for any given research study. The feasibility review. A feasibility review is conducted to ensure, as the name implies, that the research is feasible at the institution where the study will take place. 
at this institution, a, 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 a specialist at the research review office manages the feasibility of this review, manages the feasibility review. <clears throat> Different departments or institutional actors may be part of this review, depending, of course, on the nature of the study. The review must cover at least the following. The availability of the institutions for facilities, equipment, human resources required to conduct the study. The financial and contractual aspects of the research, its coverage by liability insurance, and where applicable, its imp impact on institutional resources. How drugs are managed, depending if drugs are being used in the study. Examining any conflict of interest between the research and the orientations of the institution and examining aspects of data security. Feasibility reviews occur concurrently with scholarly and ethics reviews. Note that you cannot begin a study unless you, you receive approval for all three reviews and an institutional authorized, and, and you must receive an institutional authorization letter before beginning your research. So how is the art, how is the RE being composed? It's composed of at least two members with expertise in relevant disciplines and methodologies. This means that these members must have expertise in the areas of study they are required to review. At our institution, the REB is composed of two committees, the, biomedic, the Medical Biomedical Committee and the Psychosocial Committee. The Biomedical, Biomedical co Committee review, um, that reviews clinical trials must include at minimum a physician, dentist, or pharmacist belonging to a professional order and one member experienced in a non-scientific discipline. The Psychosocial Committee requires two members that are familiar with different methodologies, for instance, qualitative, participatory, and statistical analyses. The, an REB includes, also includes one member knowledgeable in ethics and one member knowledgeable in relevant law. This person cannot be the legal counsel of the institution because that would place this member in a conflict of interest. It includes at least one community member that has no affiliation with the institution, sponsor, and not part of a, an immediate family member of a person affiliated with the institution. This community member represents the point of view of research participants or the community to which the participant belongs. This community member can be an individual or a representative of an organization interested in promoting the rights of people in areas of research being reviewed. Finally, it's to be noted that high, higher level institutional administrators cannot serve as REB members. The REB can include alternate members who can vote on decisions. The REB can include ad hoc advisors who can provide expertise on particular topics, but they cannot vote. And the REB can also include observers upon the, upon the approval of the REB, and they have no vote either. Specialists. Specialists are non-voting members of the REB. They support the REB chair and they support REB members by answering their questions and offering guidance and support based on applicable laws and policies. Specialists advise REB members of any new developments in the field, such as changes to legislation or the implementation of new policies and procedures. Specialists organize REB meetings. They provide administrative support to the REB. Their tasks include, among others, drafting REB minutes and agendas, integrating and synthesizing REB member comments to be reviewed by the REB chair and then sent to the investigator. Specialists also manage and track the review of REB submissions to which they are assigned. And they answer researchers' questions about REB members' comments they receive. What is the role of the REB chair? Evidently, one of the roles of the REB chair is to, of course, our chair REB meetings, but the REB chair ensures that meetings are conducted in accordance with applicable laws, regulations, and policies, and 
the chair ensures that the contributions of all members attending the meeting are heard and they can the chair has the power to request the removal of an REB member, of course, with justification. And the REB chair assigns studies to REB members with the assistance of the specialist. The REB chair monitors REB decisions for accuracy and consistency. The REB chair is responsible to ensure that decisions conform to applicable laws, regulations, and policies. And the chair is also responsible for ensuring the consistency of REB decisions. The, the REB chair oversees the accuracy of the meeting minutes and the comments that are sent to the investigators and has the power to suspend a study. An example of when the REB when a chair can suspend a study is when the REB learns that a participant is placed at risk by taking part in a study or when an investigator misconduct is suspected. However, the chair does not have the power to terminate a study. This decision must be taken at a full board meeting. Finally, the REB chair with the input of the specialist determines whether a study is eligible for a delegated review. That means a minimal risk study. In the next slide, I will define what is meant by studies eligible for delegated review. I draw your attention to the distinction between minimal risk and above minimal risk studies that REB are asked to review. Researchers should be aware that studies receive different levels of scrutiny based on the degree of foreseeable risks of harm. Those that are determined to be above minimal risk of harm are reviewed at a full board meeting at a preset date where quorum is required. Those studies that are determined to be minimal risk of harm are reviewed by one or more REB members who are delegated to review these studies as soon as they are assigned to them. For those who have never submitted a study to our REB, the initial process is as follows. You submit your study on an on online platform named Nagano. You contact the research office to obtain an account if you don't already have one. The submitted study is screened by a gatekeeper according to specific criteria. This screening is best defined as a process to ensure that the submitted study contains the information the REB needs to conduct its review. The gatekeeper returns suboptimal submissions, that is those that do not meet the criteria for REB review. In a suboptimal submission, information may be missing or information may be inaccurate or documents contain inconsistencies. For example, the protocol may be unclear or illogical that would lead REB members to be confused or, in another case, the consent form guidelines were not followed. It's unfair to ask REB members to waste their time on the research studies that are not ready for their review. The gatekeeper is, the role of the gatekeeper is not to weigh in on significant ethical issues that arise in any given submission. This role is strictly under the purview of the REB. However, the gatekeeper helps the, the researchers to avoid delays. The gatekeeper provides educational support to research, researchers for submissions that are seen to be suboptimal. The gatekeeper can provide advice and resources to researchers. Once an REB submission meets the criteria for acceptable review, it is assigned to the REB specialist, and it's at this point, the specialist takes on responsibility for processing the submission for REB review. Once the REB has reviewed the study submission, the specialist's role is to answer any questions the research may have concerning the comments that the researcher receives from the REB. What information does the REB require? Of course, the type of information the REB requires depends upon the nature of the study. A clinical trial, a qualitative study, and a survey each require different types of information because each has a different design and methodology. 
The REB needs a comprehensive and well-written protocol that includes different types of information, and importantly, such as the identification of the specific risks of harm and how these risks will be mitigated. To conduct its review, the REB requires a protocol and, and consent form that follow institutional guidelines, other pertinent documents, depending on the type of study, and these include advertisement, patient diaries, questionnaires, even if these are validated, recruitment scripts, case report forms, no objection letters from Health Canada, and project grant notices of decision. That means the result of your grant, of your grant, the results of your grant. For the remainder of the, this webinar, I'll focus on two areas where the REB frequently notices deficiencies, certain aspects of the consent process and conducting retrospective health records research without obtaining informed consent. Informed consent is considered a process that begins with recruitment. Many people don't realize this. Different strategies can be used to recruit participants as long as the process is conducted ethically. The REB is very interested in verifying who makes initial contact with a part potential participant to introduce a study. Potential participants are initially contacted by a person that they would expect to have knowledge about them for reasons of respecting the personal privacy of these potential participants. The person making initial contact introduces the study, and this person can be a treating clinician, such as a physician, nurse, physiotherapist, or it can even be a person with administrative responsibilities, such as someone who sets up patient appointments. Initial contact can also be made via email, a person issuing an email introducing the study must have prior access to the email addresses of those being contacted. For instance, if a researcher is recruiting health professionals, someone who is part of a professional association and has access to these emails of its members can send a recruitment email to its members. The REB highly recommends including recruitment scripts in REB submissions where applicable. Recruitment scripts include the information that you are transmitting verbally or in writing to potential participants and also to those who will help you recruit participants on your behalf. If participants, if potential participants agree to learn more about the study after being contacted, the person making initial contact then refers these potential participants to a member of the research team. Importantly, to respect a potential participant's personal privacy, when they are referred, the person making the referral does not transmit any other personal health information other than the contact information to a member of the research team. The person referring the participant may have verified the eligibility of the participant if the research team requests that it be verified. This part of the consent process must be detailed and approved by the REB. We received many questions about gaining access to patient health records, to, to gaining access to health records for, for recruitment purposes. Currently, according to legal counsel of our institution, examining patient health records for research recruitment purposes is not permitted. Potential participants who are patients have not given permission for their health records to be accessed by people who are not involved in their care. This position notably may change with the implementation of new legislation, Loa Sank. The REB can, in some circumstances and at its discretion, approve this type of recruitment strategy, but this decision lies very much in a gray zone legally. The REB would want to know when participants are approached. Timing can be important. For instance, potential participants can be initially approached about a study before their clinic visit 
where they discuss the results of their tests with their physician. Unfortunately, it has occurred that some potential participants have learned of a health life-threatening diagnosis while being recruited, but before being given their diagnosis. Conversely, potential participants can be initially, uh, can be initially approached immediately after receiving a life-threatening diagnosis, but being approached at this time can be stressful because they have not had the time yet to process this diagnosis, let alone information about a research study. The REB would want to know when and or how potential participants are approached. If recruiting in person, potential participants should be approached in a private setting. Recruitment should take place in ways that do not intrude inappropriate, inappropriately on personal privacy. So don't recruit in public areas. For instance, don't recruit in patient waiting rooms where others in the waiting room can learn why the patient is eligible for a study. No one in the waiting room should be privy to this type of personal health information. The REB requires information about the approach used to recruit participants, the type of recruitment tools used, as such as I mentioned before, recruitment strips and posters, flyers, and information posted on social media. And the information posted on social media does contain a lot contain a significant number of ethical issues, but I will not discuss that today. The importance of, of including complete information about re, of recruitment procedures cannot be overstated. Participants who take part in research voluntarily are expressing their autonomy. Autonomy includes the ability to deliberate about a decision and to act based on that deliberation. deliberation. Respecting autonomy means giving due deference to a person's judgment and ensuring that that person is free to choose without interference. An expression of this autonomy is the decision to participate in research voluntarily. There can be threats to voluntariness. Researchers must be aware of these threats. The voluntariness of research is important because it respects human dignity and means that individuals have chosen to participate in research according to their own values, preferences, and wishes. REBs and researchers should be cognizant of situations where undue influence, coercion, or the offer of incentives may undermine the voluntariness of a participant's consent to participate in research. Begin by talking about what is undue influence. And I'll also stress how we distinguish consent to treatment with consent to, to, to research. When, you're, when you are a patient, you're motivated by your personal needs. You assume a certain degree of risk. You expect certain therapeutic benefits, you want to get better, and you will hopefully you will get better. The intent of your treating clinician is to make you better. As a patient, you give consent so that you can get better. When you enroll a patient, when you are a patient who enrolls in a, in a clinical or experimental research study, you are a volunteer agreeing to subject yourself to testing an experimental intervention, a new drug or a new type of cognitive therapy, for instance. You assume a certain degree of risk because the outcome for effectiveness is unknown. It's experimental. The new drug or intervention is not standard of care. A research study is not designed to give individual care for your specific needs. You should not expect a personal benefit from the experimental intervention. Of course, you hope you do, but you can't really expect it. You should be motivated by altruistic intentions. You are participating in this study for the good of society, 
so that what researchers learn can contribute to knowledge. And the intent of your treating clinician, who is at the same time a research, researcher, is to acquire knowledge through this research study about the experimental drug or intervention. As a patient, you are consenting to testing an experimental drug or intervention. The importance of distinguishing consent given for treatment and that given for research is very important. As importantly, when a clinician assumes the role of a researcher at the same time, these roles are not only different, but can conflict with each other. Many researchers wear two hats, one of a researcher and one of as a clinician. And inherently, assuming these roles create ethical tensions. These ethical tensions are not bad in and of themselves, but need to be managed. Researchers should separate as much as possible, to the greatest extent possible, their role as a researcher from other roles as therapists, caregivers, teachers, advisors, consultants, supervisors, employers, and the like. If a researcher is acting in dual roles, this fact must always be disclosed to the participant. I should have said this before, but throughout this presentation, I refer to the TCPS 222 policy document. And as a, um, our, our institution is obliged to adhere to the policies in this institution, it, in policies <laughs> to, uh, by the TCPS. It's ethically appropriate for clinical clinician researchers to approach their patients and introduce a study. But clinician researchers should avoid being involved in the remainder of the consent process. Obtaining participants' consent to research when the treating clinician is also the researcher is considered ethically problematic. A clinician may create undue influence inadvertently because patients may mistake an experimental intervention for routine clinical care because their treating clinician is recruiting them for the study. Such confusion has been well documented and it's known as therapeutic misconception. So how does a clinician researcher manage this ethical tension to ensure their patients understand the experimental intervention is not part of routine care, routine clinical care? I worked for a physician who told me that when he introduced a study to his patients, some would tell him they wanted to sign the consent form immediately before knowing anything more about the study because they trusted him implicitly. The physician would insist on referring the patients to a member of the research team telling the patient that someone else would explain the study in further detail and patients were free at that time to decide whether or not they want to take they wanted to take part in the research. However, in some exceptional circ circumstances, it may be impossible for a clinician research, researcher to delegate the informed consent task. Then that fact, the fact that the researcher is acting in dual roles as a treating clinician as a, and as a researcher must be disclosed to the participant. A justification must be provided to the REB in such a circumstance. In all circumstances, however, the clinician researcher should answer patients' questions about a study insofar as these questions pertain to the patient's health and well-being. So in summary, best practices for obtaining informed consent for, a, for, a, for an intervention include the following steps. Treating clinicians can introduce a study to their patients. The remainder of the consent for process should be delegated to a member of the research team or someone not involved in the patient's care. That's a member of the research team. Before informed consent is obtained, treating clinicians should answer their patients' questions about the study that are related to their patient's specific health and well being.
So how is the concept coercion understood to affect voluntariness? Participants can experience harm when their consent is not given willingly and intentionally. Examples of this type of harm have included scandals in the past involving prisoners who were enrolled in research but were coerced in doing so by prison authorities. Other populations where coercion occurred include people with disabilities and people with mental illness. Our consent form contains an obligatory legal clause to address certain forms of, co of coercion. It reads, your decision not to participate in this research project or to withdraw from it will have no impact on the quality of care and services to which you are entitled or, to your or on your relationship with the clinical teams providing care, providing them. To illustrate an actual example of coercion, I present the case of Dan Markinson. Dan was a young man who suffered from severe delusions and paranoia. He wanted to murder his mother. He was committed involuntarily and subsequently enrolled in a clinical trial testing antipsychotic drugs for schizophrenia. But Dan had been diagnosed as having another mental condition and not schizophrenia. Nonetheless, he was enrolled in the study. His treating physician was also the principal investigator for the study. After Dan's physician researcher had discussed the study with him and obtained Dan's consent, a judge stayed or stopped the institutional commitment order with the condition that Dan comply with treatment plans. And it appeared that the experimental drug was considered part of the treatment plan and not the research. Dan's consent form included a standard clause indicating that if the medication was not working, Dan could withdraw from the study. But Dan did not believe nor understand that he was mentally ill. And therefore, it was unlikely he would ask to be withdrawn from the study. But Dan also believed that withdrawing from the study would lead him to being institutionalized, which, after the judge's decision, seemed likely. Dan perceived an intentional threat of harm were he to withdraw from the study. In other words, his participation in the study was coerced. A threat, to a threat to voluntariness can also be in the form of incentives. In Quebec, the offer of incentives is not permitted. A, person, a, person, a person's participation in research that could interfere with the integrity of this person may not give rise to any financial reward other than the payment of an indemnity as compensation, and I underline compensation for the loss and inconvenience suffered. This is Article 25 of our Quebec Civil Code. Participants can be compensated monetarily for the time and effort spent on taking part in a study. Justifiable expenses incurred as a result of research participation should be, should be reimbursed. For example, cost traveling, getting to the hospital, or meal expenses, or childcare, or in some cases, the uses, use of technology, and so on. Gift cards, if approved by the REB, can be used as compensation. But offering prizes, draws, and large amounts of money are considered offers of, are considered incentives. They cannot, it's more likely that, <laughs> It's more likely that if you participate in a research study because you can win a prize. Research participants cannot be paid, because at one point I had seen an ad on a Kijiji site in the employment section. Um, it cannot be profitable. And also note that other Canadian provinces and other jurisdictions may have different rules on the use of incentives. I bring this up because many many issues, many um, requirements that we have are based on, uh, it is jurisdiction specific. 
And um, if you go in some places in the United States, people get paid to, uh, they make their money. Uh, I'm not saying this is a good thing, but they make their money going from one clinical trial to another. The next topic I will address is the use of existing patient health records. Can existing health records be used for research purposes when participants give informed consent? Yes, of course. Once the REB approves, then of course, once you get it, obtain consent, you, and if the patient is given, the participant is given consent for the use of health records, you can access these health records. But what about when informed consent is not obtained from participants? Well, that depends. Quebec laws apply, and we recently have a new law, Loi 25, which applies. Many residents, students, and those new to research often conduct studies that involve using information extracted from patients' existing medical or health records without obtaining these patients' informed consent. This type of research is known as retrospective health records research. And I'll refer to it as RHRR. And other, other terms used for this type of research is retrospective chart review. For this type of research, patients are never contact, contacted and prospective data is not collected from them. According to the laws of Quebec, a derogation of the rule of law for obtaining informed consent is required to conduct RHHR, and that's stipulated in Article 24 of the Civil Code. This code, this article stipulates that informed consent must be obtained in writing unless the REB considers the justification for obtaining informed consent in an alternate manner is acceptable. The TCPS2, which is a policy document, sets certain conditions that researchers must meet to conduct RHHR. And these conditions are verified by the REB. But I also draw your attention to a new law Loi 25 that was adopted by the Quebec National Assembly in 2022. It's entitled La Loi modernisant des dispositives législatives en matière de protection des renseignements personnels dans le secteur privé. It is consistent with the conditions of the TCPS 2 2022 for the use of patient health records without their consent, but also adds other conditions. According to the according to Loi 25, a specific privacy impact, e, the acronym is EFVP, must be completed and included in the REB study submission. Once a study receives REB approval, a specially designated institutional committee outside the REB is required is mandated to review the form. The committee must be assured that five elements are respective, respected. The research objective can only be achieved if the information is identifiable, it's unreasonable, and, and which means that the identify, I'm sorry, I'll go back to point one. The research objective can only be achieved if the information is identifiable, which means that the identifiable information is essential to the research. It's Number two, it's unreasonable to require the researcher to obtain the consent of people concerned, which means that, the, that it's not feasible to conduct the research otherwise. The research objective pursued outweighs the public interest of provide, protecting privacy for the disclosure and use of personal information. Appropriate measures are taken to ensure that the personal information obtained and used remains confidential, which is self-explanatory. Secondary use of health records can introduce additional risks up to participants, such as when linking data or adding data to a repository. And finally, 
the institution ensures only the necessary information for conducting the research is communicated to the researcher, which means the institution is responsible for ensuring that it tr tr transmit only the personal information necessary to conduct the research. Putting it another way, the institution does not allow a researcher to search through a patient's medical file. Our institution provides guidance for researchers contemplating a retrospective health records study without consent. A guideline has been created and a guideline has been created and for a study study to be accepted by our REB you must file this guidance document entitled guidance for creating and submitting a retrospective health records research study. Within this guideline contains a requirement for a data management plan or a DMP. It is to be submitted together with the protocol. DMPs are required so that to be in compliance with national guidelines. The guideline, the guideline that we provide provides instruction on accessing and using the, por the, the Portage Data Management Plan Assistant Tool. Uh, you need an account. Uh, you need to open an account to access this tool. We have found that many researchers confuse the classification or categories of private information. This review may be helpful to researchers. Information with, identify with direct identifiers. Information in this category can include identifying information, such as a person's name, social insurance number, or provincial health insurance number. Indirect identifying information, information in this category can include a personal address, a date of birth, gender, a postal code, and when used in combination can identify a participant. Coded information, information in this category, in, in, in this category is included when direct and indirect identifiers are removed and replaced with a code. Generally, the principal investigator holds the code list, but someone with access to the code can identify participants. Anonymized information. Information in this category is included when identifying information has been, uh, identifying information has been permanently removed. The code that linked participants' personal information is destroyed. The chance of re-identification from uh, indirect identifiers is low. Finally, anonymous information. Information in this category includes information that never had identifiers. An example would be a survey where no identifying information is collected. The chance of re-identifying, including uh, IP addresses. The chance of re-identifying participants who took part in an online survey where, where no addresses are collected would be very low. This data collection method may not be ideal for certain types of research, however. IP addresses are often collected, especially in surveys, to ensure the data is valid and to stop bots. In my experience, I've noticed that researchers can and often confuse anonymized and anonymous information. This is why I've put it up there and it's important to recognize this distinction. The word confidentiality is often bandied about. What does it mean? According to the TCPS2, the ethical duty of confidentiality refers to the obligation of an individual or organization to safeguard entrusted information. The ethical duty of confidentiality includes obligations to protect information from unauthorized access, use, disclosure, modification, lost or theft. When personal information is accessed, collected, analyzed, and shared for research purposes, this information, of course, must be protected. Failure to protect this information is considered a breach of confidentiality. Importantly, the protection of personal information is considered a shared responsibility among researchers, REBs, and institutions where personal information is collected, used, stored, and possibly shared. Institutions are responsible for creating and maintaining a supportive research environment. 
Institutions establish appropriate safeguards, such as providing access to secure servers or secure survey tools. They develop and implement policies and procedures. Institutions are not responsible for keeping researchers up to date on best practices. I'm sorry, they're not only responsible, the inst institutions are not only responsible for keeping researchers up to date on best practices, they also have a role to educate and support REVs. So, Researchers and REBs must be aware of the host of laws, regulations, and policies that may apply to ensure the confidentiality of personal information. And this applies to retrospective health records research. Specific communities have rules and policies that apply to researchers. For example, when conducting research with First Nation communities, a set of principles named OCAP. OCAP stands for Ownership, Access, control and possession of the data. Local institutions like our own and help create rules for policies for the storage and sharing of information to which researchers must adhere. I spoke about Loi 25, but was that was but Loi 5 was recently adopted and will be shortly implemented. It deals with personal health records, defining who can be granted access to these health records for research purposes and addresses issues like a, a broad consent among others. Notably, each province has privacy, privacy legislation that must be respected. Privacy laws differ across Canada and health privacy laws are just an are, are such an example. At the national level, we often hear about PEPIDA. PEPIDA is a federal law that applies to information held by the private sector, but not in Quebec, BC, and Alberta, who have their own set of laws. If research is being conducted internationally, other laws and policies apply. For instance, in Europe, the GDPR, or the General Data Protection Regulation, applies to researchers conducting research in Europe. According to GDPR's website, it's the toughest privacy and security law in the world. And that applies to inform personal information and it can involve heavy fines if breaches of confidentiality were to occur. And another example of a, of a law involving confidentiality among others is the Declaration of Helsinki. And I wanna point out that there are many laws that apply depending on where you conduct your research and the type of research you conduct. So in summary, the points touched upon this webinar include that REBs are independent in their decision-making and report to the highest authority in the institution, which is the board of directors. REB members' roles and responsibilities are clearly defined and for each role, specific expertise is required. The informed consent process begins with initial contact of a potential participant from someone who is known, known to them. The threat of vol the voluntariness of participation in research can be threatened by undue influence, coercion, or the offer of, extent of incentives and must be avoided. And retrospective health record, health record research without obtaining informed consent can be conducted if certain conditions are met and ensuring confidentiality of patient health information and respecting patient privacy is an important ethical concern. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Linda, for that wonderful presentation. Um, questions, please feel free to put in the chat or just uh, unmute and ask. So one of, one of the things um, that we deal with are discarded tissues. Um, can you comment on the primary and secondary use of discarded tissue? What I mean by that is if, you, if we get uh, discarded tissue from maybe from surgery, uh, then we use it for one purpose, and then somebody comes and says, oh, you have got tissues. Can I use it <laughs> to run other studies? Can you 
comment on that? No, you need you need specific consent for the use of tissues in research. So left in other jurisdictions, it might work differently, but in Quebec, you need specific consent from the patient. You have to ask them for their consent to use their tissue for research. Many people uh, create, create tissue banks. Some researchers do that so they can have access to the tissues for different research purposes. Okay. So there are some uh, questions on the chat. Uh, one of the questions from Mashid. Um, thanks for the presentation. I just wonder how uh, could uh, Rev minimize the conflict of interest in scholarly review for non-CHR and non-FRQS applications? And uh, the second part is why feasibility review should be Rev's task? Okay, I'll answer the first and then maybe I'll need to. Okay, scientific review, we assign, um, we assign, it's really not under the jurisdiction of the REB, but I know it hap how it happens. And what we're very vigilant on is to make sure there are no conflict of interests for the, pe the reviewers that review. I can't comment what, hap what happens with the granting agencies, but if we are conducting a, um, a scientific review, we have to um, make sure that there's no conflict of interest with this, with th that the um, person reviewing the study does not have a vested interest in that study. Okay, uh, so there's and, another, okay, the second part, did you? Yeah, could you repeat the second part, please? Why feasibility review should be REB's task? It isn't the REB's task. I, 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 maybe I didn't make myself clear. There are three processes according to Quebec's regulatory framework. You need an REB review. The institution is required to conduct a feasibility review. And uh, well, uh, we have the, the, the REB review, the science review, and a feasibility review. And that is required to make sure that we have the resources necessary to conduct the study, that you've got the necessary permissions from different departments, um, if there's if the data is being held in another institution, then you need an institution, you need to conduct, contact the legal department to make sure you have a, a legal agreement to keep, that the data is, is, if the data is traveling or if it's being kept elsewhere, and so on and so forth. Okay, thanks. Uh, La Voix, Raphael. Hi, thank you. Um, regarding initial contact of a patient or a family, in case yes. of a patient that cannot respond themselves, um, can a physician introduce a team member for to introduce the the project? Yeah, that's that's part of a part of the process. If you say, if you go to the patient and you say, I guess it would be the patient's family member or whatever, because that's a whole other other issue of who you, uh, you know, who's the person that's allowed to respond for the person who, I'm understanding the person has, lacks mental capacity, is that, am I correct? Yes, yeah. like in okay. case of patients that are unresponsive. Unresponsive, okay. So they're unresponsive, so they cannot consent for themselves. So then you contact the family member, the physician can introduce the study and say, you know, I have this study and involves this, you know, uh, just very briefly. And then say, if you're interested, I can refer you to someone, to someone. And uh, at that point, uh, the study is explained. You have to make sure that the person is, is qualified to be the person's legal representative, the, um, the caregiver or whoever is responding on behalf of the unresponsive pa patient. And the person um, you need to... Um, uh, the, the person, you need a witness, and on the consent form, uh, the person can sign on their behalf. And um, once, the, if the patient becomes responsive, then you need to re you need to obtain consent from that patient. That's that's an issue I actually have right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I can I, I can lay, let other people uh, ask question and come back to it later. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Miranda. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, 
I'm quite familiar with the REB process. Uh, you had mentioned uh, that the new bill um, five is going to have some changes. Do you, could you specify a bit on what those changes will be and how will that impact research going forward? Okay, Loi 25, it's a law. It's no longer a bill. It was approved in 2022. That law sets into motion where I refer to the EFVP form that you have to fill out and there's another committee that has to review it in addition to the REB. Yes, you, you said that there's going to be, uh, I, I, I know about the 25, but you said that there's the, uh, the a new there's one law coming. Sank, a law number five. And that's yeah. passed. And there, their talk, there's, it hasn't been implemented yet. I think they're still working out the kinks. But what I do know, it speaks to who can have access to data, not only here, but um, not only within an institution, but all health data kept in Quebec. I mean, it's broader than just health data. It's a major law, but as it applies to Quebec, as it applies to health data, um, people will be able to have access. I mean, of course, there's going to be a process in place, procedures in place. And it also, the other issue I know it's going to speak to is broad consent. Okay. So um, I imagine it's going to involve more, um, more paperwork because the EFVP form is quite uh, detailed on who is active actually getting access we're as curious as you are how that's all going to work together okay okay great okay Ho hopefully it's nothing yeah but th this committee yeah. is here to stay I think I I, I I also want to take this opportunity to say that if there are de delays some people think it's because of for these health record research without consent it's not because of the REB generally it's because of the committee and uh, I would tell students to tell their supervisors, or you could per perhaps talk to um, the administrators at Lady Davis, because it's completely out of our control at the REB. And uh, first, first, I think I would, excuse me, I want to take that back and say, first, you should call data security and find out what's happening, because they are in charge of that committee. And if, you know, if you see that delays are too long, then you can escalate. Great. Thank uh, you very much. Thanks. Cassandra? Hi. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. It's really, it's really important that we have guidance when it comes to the REB because things can become very uh, complicated. So I had a question just about deferrals. So I have a project um, that was uh, deferred. Um, and in uh, the first condition, um, in their response, um, they basically said they they asked uh, me to contact um, the panel um, to schedule a team's meeting just to like figure out, uh, like to discuss um, just like some some issues and some questions that they had so they could have some more information um, before resubmitting. And then they also said when resubmitting the study um, to organize like my presence um to at like a full uh board meeting um to present the project so i had a couple questions just first off are these like two separate things or is this the same thing i was i was a little bit confused um like if you have any experience with deferral um and if, yeah. i don't know i don't have the comments in front of me so mm -hmm. but i will tell you generally when it's deferred that means the reb didn't have enough information to make a decision so um, did they, if they told you, did they tell you who to contact on Teams? Yeah, yeah. We, I have an email to, uh, to contact, but I, I wanted to know, like, what should I, like, what do they usually expect? Um, no, no. Meetings, if, like, if, should I okay, there's two yeah. separate things. Generally, mm -hmm. when you're, you have the first condition to conduct Teams, again, I haven't read the comments you receive, but generally that's a team meeting to help you to get prepared for the full board meeting. Oh, that, okay. <laughs> okay, that, that makes sense. Okay? That's the yeah. gatekeeping. Say, hey, okay. you know, this isn't ready. Why don't you call us and we'll kind of try and help you with this. 
Mm -hmm. And once it's ready, once you understand what are some of the problems are, then yeah. we'll, you'll, we'll, you'll be invited to, to present at the full board meeting so that the REB members can understand. But again, okay. I haven't read your comments, but I suspect that's what it, what it means. That, that makes sense, actually. Like, now, I was confused why the two meetings were necessary, but that makes sense. Yeah. And it's, um, it's really yeah. to help. It really yeah. helps. And when we do this gatekeeping, it's not long that we're doing it, but it really saves you time in the long in the long term, because you're you're more prepared and you don't have this back and forth as often because you understand there's some basic issues that need to be uh, addressed. And so you can address that before it goes to the REB. OK, great. Thank you. OK. So we have uh, another question in the chat by Marianne Gagnon. Uh, how do you distinguish reasonable compensation to incentive? That's a very good question. The REB determines that. But when you have to think about it, we think about it as the, I'll give you some examples. You, what is determined to be reasonable compensation is what would be reasonable to the average person. Um, giving somebody $500 to, um, <clears throat> you know, to come in for a study visit would be certainly, would certainly be an incentive. At the same time, if you have somebody that's really, really poor and you offer them $10, they may think that's great. So there's a reasonable person standard. And, um, and really, it's not all, it's more you have to think in terms of not how much you pay, how much money you're giving or what the gift card is, but you're saying what's a reasonable compensation for their time. Uh, you know, if, if you're recruiting health professionals, you might give them a bit more money because if they're using their personal time, then you know you might pay them a little more if you're recruiting professionals. If you're recruiting ordinary, regular people, your patients, um, you know, you know how many hours are they are they spending, um, are they contributing of their time for this study, and you know, uh, do, do, are they going to incur uh, transportation costs? Like in one study we did with youths, um, the researcher provided lunch and uh, and and um, and transportation public tra tickets for public transportation. And I don't know if they were compensating by the hour, but at like a reasonable rate. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I think uh, uh, Raphael wants to. Uh, Raphael? Yes, uh, I have a few more questions. Okay. Uh, the, the most pressing one was uh, ac accessing records for a screening patient. Yeah. Uh, like for us, it is really important to look for which patient are eligible to then ask clinicians if they, if they authorize. Well, I, I, I don't know. If they're your own patients, you can go through the file. But no, you're no, not... Not, not in the beginning, like, for example, patient that had uh, admitted to the ICU. Yes. I need to know if a patient is um, like eligible to then yes. reach out the clinician. But the clinician should be able to tell you if the Remember. patient is eligible. Well, that, does that mean that I need to ask clinician about yes. every patient in the ICU? Unfortunately, the law, the way it is, it it is myself and asking for individual patients that are. Yeah, according to the law, yes, because that patient has not given you permission because the, that is not your patient. From what I understand, you're telling me this is not your patient, so you should not be looking in their medical file. The pa patient hasn't given you permission to do that. Does. So, the it, it, chart, if you, if, does the chuck the shock sheet at a patient's bedside is considered their electronic record? Is 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 considered their record? Yes. Yes. 
Oof. Okay. Uh, and concerning and, and this is this comes from our legal department. So I'm just making you aware. Yeah, yeah. It just makes basically our studies un, unfeasible. Um, but as I said, you can approach the REB with this problem. They might make an exception, but they'd have to consider it. It would have to go to the legal department because you're saying that the study, you know, I'm taking you as what you're telling me is it's not feasible. So, because you know. To my understanding, we have, uh, uh, we have authorization to do it. If you do, that's fine. I'm not aware. Like I can't. I can't. Uh, I can't uh, comment on that. Before I started, so I was just very worried. Um, regarding reconsenting, uh, for example, I have patients at the ICU. They are un unresponsive. Then I have consent from the family. I'm following them throughout their stay at the ICU. I'm trying to like get reconsent when they're going, for example, on a, another floor, but. Like, are we expecting the patient to be able to read a consent form? Well, that, that, there, there there has to be a judgment. First of all, I have I have a beef about reading consent forms. I don't think that's the best way to obtain consent. I think you need a discussion. You need to go through the elements of the consent form. But any educator will tell you that when you read something to somebody, they don't really absorb it as well as when you have a discussion. So best practices in, re in in obtaining consent is to have a discussion. As long as you cover all the the essential elements that a participant should know, and then um, consent. If the cons if the participant can't sign, you need a witness, and um, and 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 document that on the consent form to reconsent them. I don't know if this helps your situation. Definitely, like I just, I felt like I was trapped in a situation that I was, like the patient recovered enough that I could have a discussion with her. Yes. But she was in distress. There was no way she could look at the consent form. Okay. But she so understood. If you have a, if you have a witness there to witness that and yes. to sign, then that's fine. My uh, another point I wanted to ask for is like for external data, data coming from another site, like. Uh, American Center sending us their data mm -hmm. to analyze. Um, is there anything specific that needs to be done re regarding to the RB? Like they have their own like or, uh, it approval to get that data initially, but once like do we need an RB to analyze it locally? Do you is this a data bank? No. No. Okay. What I would say is consult the legal department before you start because if you're if you're that is being transferred to this institution um well you can apply to the REB and you can say that you're using data from another institution and that study has gotten approval um how that works legal like i, I it, the data will stay on on your on on the institutional um server Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, it it's different when it's it, like the uh, difference between open source data and data coming in from external where the ethics was approved, where it was collected. I don't really see the difference in terms of what we're doing with it. No, no, I don't see the difference either. I just don't know because I don't know what how the legal department would look at it. Yeah. It may be it may be fine. But I can't. I prefer not to answer that right now. Perfect. So you, you can contact our office and I and and you know send us a question and then I can send you an appropriate answer. Great. Um, and regarding uh, computing infrastructure, like once you have like coded information, no, I would stop using anonymized information. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, but coding once we have coded. Uh, data set, can we send them, for example, to Compute Canada infrastructure? Again, that that you need the legal department to determine that. That has to be all documented in, in the protocol, and it's part of the feasibility, feasibility um, um, review. Yep. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. So, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fallini, and uh, 
everyone for participating in this uh, really wonderful um, presentation that we all need. Uh, we all need to be aware of the ethics. Um, and uh, please uh, uh, send, send us uh, what you would like to hear, uh, what sort of uh, talks you would like to hear. Uh, the ethics is something that a lot of people wanted to hear. And thank you very much uh, for giving that. So this presentation will be on our website, like all other presentations. Uh, you can visit our uh, experimental surgery website and uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Linda. May, may I mention something? Yeah. I highly recommend that people complete the TCPS2 core 22 uh, course on research ethics. Many institutions require it. I think McGill does. It's something for new researchers or students that they can add to their CV and you get a certificate at the end. And the last point I want to make is that for any inquiries or you have any comments about this presentation or any other issues, you can contact me at the address um, indicated there or at cerjghmcgill.ca. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a wonderful week. And uh, Thank you. enjoy research with uh, good uh, ethical principles. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 bye.